The Unshackled Waves, episode 194. Broadcasting from Melbourne, Australia, this is The Unshackled Waves with Tim Wills. Brought to you by theunshackled.net. Hello everyone, great to have your company. Today we are catching up with an old friend of the Unshackled, Diane Colbert from All Nations Christian Mental Health Association. You may remember she was a speaker at the Rally Against Safe Schools in Melbourne in April earlier this year. We also went to visit Diane to cover one of her Family Values Alliance uh, speeches in Ballarat in May. She is continuing her educational campaign against safe schools and the spread of gender theory in our education system. And she's in the studio with us today. Diane, good to see you again. Thanks so much, Tim. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Now, uh, since this is the, the first first time we've caught up in a while, I thought I'd start by asking you where we're at with, with safe schools. Other states have, have got rid of the program, but here in Victoria, the Andrews government is going full steam ahead. Yeah, that's correct. While it was banned to have gender theory in schools by the federal government, the state government of Victoria has pushed full steam ahead with funding it and not just safe schools, but a, a lot of other programs that are actually providing gender theory and much of it actually comes through the sexual and health education as well as through um, general safe schools type programs. So people need to be aware if they hear health education, it might actually have a lot of the early sexualization of children and young people as well as things like catching on early, catching on later. So actually there's a lot of stuff. It almost seems to be um, integrated throughout the whole school system. Yeah, you're exactly right that it's not just safe schools. There are another program that uh, us at the Unshackled have covered quite a bit is Respect for Relationships, mm. which has a lot of horrendous uh, sexual content in it and uh, like, like you were saying there's a th uh, there's a whole bunch of key words you have to notice to uh, realize that there's going to be a whole lot of sexual content in this yeah and unfortunately it really is very much way above and beyond the level of content that we should be exposing children to you know there really is a graphic sexualization of kids happening in our schools and that's really concerning now, what we've also seen lately is one of the, the issues that's of concern to you is uh, children uh, transitioning their, their gender. And uh, what we saw is that the, the medical community in Australia, they released a uh, transgender children health guidelines because a lot of the, the gender clinics around uh, Australia have uh, seen a 200% rise in children pre presenting with gender dysphoria. Yeah, we might have seen 10 years ago, one or two children per year presenting themselves at a gender clinic where I think the actual stats were around 256 children presented themselves last year to the Royal Melbourne Hospital's gender clinic. So there's really been a skyrocketing increase and a lot of people are questioning why do we suddenly have such huge numbers of children presenting themselves for transitioning, for transgender surgery. And I, and I think the programs that we've just discussed really are a large part of the reason for that, that they're taught, well, if you feel like you're a girl, you're a girl. And if you feel like you're a boy, you're a boy, independent of biology. And as the American College of Pediatricians says, that actually destroys a child's ability for reality testing. You know, kids are good with imagination. You know, some people say, oh, I thought I was a fairy when I was a kid and I tried my hardest to fly. Well, nobody's actually encouraged that child to be a fairy just because they felt like a, ther a fairy, you know, and we, we don't treat any other mental health condition in the same manner as we treat someone who has gender dysphoria, which is genuine distress. You know, it's a, an awful condition for a child to actually live through. And so, but it is a dysphoria, you know, it is still listed in the DSM-5 as a disorder. But what people are doing is they're normalizing it in a way that we don't do with anything else. Let's just say you're uncomfortable with your arm. You feel like, well, I'm really uncomfortable with this part of my body. We, we don't chop your arm off as some well, people some have. Don't. Yeah, some have. But, you know, we still recognize that this is not best practice, that this is harmful. It's not helpful for you. In the same way, you know, some people 
have anorexia and you know I remember one person with anorexia writing why is anorexia disorder but not gender dysphoria a disorder why is that seen as an identity you know we don't give someone with anorexia who feels fat a tummy tuck because we know that's not the problem that it's a psychological problem and yet our culture has so abandoned biology in this area that they are now treating something that is a psychological problem as if it's a physical problem. The transgender advocates say that the reason there's this surge is because there, there's a lot more awareness of, uh, now about uh, uh, young people who are feeling that they've got a crisis with their identity and there's, there's a lot more realisation that it's a gender dysphoria and that uh, a lot of the advocates also point to the self-harm that's in these children with, with uh, gender dysphoria and say that we, we need to treat them because otherwise they'll, they'll self-harm or they'll, they'll, be, uh, uh, they'll, uh, they'll be dead. You know, I hear that a lot. And one of the things that concerns me is we actually say, for example, if we don't give them a surgery, they'll suicide. You're causing the suicide. But you know, Tim, there's never actually ever been any research that has directly looked at why do transgender people suicide? You know, if you've got dysphoria, you have a depression. Depression is one of the common reasons for suicide. How much of the suicides do we see simply because of depression or anxiety? You know, they say 87% of suicides are due to mental issues, mental health problems. So if we've got 87% of suicides due to mental health problems, and if gender dysphoria is still listed as a mental health problem, then it actually makes sense to me why the suicide rates are so high. And I guess the other thing I'd like to just draw your attention to is there was a study done in Sweden because a lot of people say, oh, but it's a stigma, it's the stigma. Well, you know, Sweden is the most accepting place. There's no problem to be transgender, you know, there's no, no, no stigma whatsoever with it. And yet there's that really high suicide early death rate in spite of the fact that there is no stigma. So what I would say to people who advocate that is, show me the research, quality research that's looked at actually why these people suicide, those that have gender dysphoria. Until you actually do some evidence-based research, you can't make that claim. And it's a few transgender advocates that they've said to me that it's not uh, as easy as it's made out to undergo a, a gender transition. You have to go through intense counselling and that doctors have to be fully convinced that the, the only way forward is for uh, a child or an adult for that matter to uh, transition gender. And it's not a decision made, made lightly because, well, in the case of male to female, it makes them infertile and so that they they do argue that, that there are these safeguards in place to to make sure that there is uh, no what, what's called trans regret or a de transitioning uh, you you're not convinced by that well considering recent people that i've met and studies that i've heard no i'm not convinced of that i mean i recently met a parent of a teenager in western australia and she'd actually been raped the, the daughter at around 15 years old or 14 and after the rape she had what would be called rapid gender dysphoria okay she suddenly felt like she was a boy in a girl's body now she went to see a psychologist and within one visit she's diagnosed as transgender whatever that means being diagnosed as transgender and she's immediately put towards changing they haven't explored the psychological trauma of the rape that this girl endured now, to me, that's actually really harmful. They've made a decision and it seems to me that it's become politically incorrect. If, if someone comes into your office and says, I feel like I'm a boy in a girl's body or a girl in a boy's body, it's politically incorrect to do anything but affirm their feelings. You're not allowed to look at their history. You're not allowed to look at the trauma. And it's interesting to me that even a lesbian who is heavily involved with the American Psychological Association, which is the most LGBTQ friendly organization that you can find. Even this lesbian says, for some reason they've shut down the ability for us to go and explore trauma and reasons for 
the, the causes of things that we might be suffering. We're not allowed to have those conversations. Say if the process was improved to your satisfaction, would you accept that there are some people who the, the only way forward for them is to transition, provided they're well aware of the, the risks, obviously, oh, we, we talked about uh, infertility, but all the other effects of uh, hormones? I think adults are allowed to make their own decisions if they're fully informed as adults and they're allowed to um, know what the consequences are. I don't think a 16 year old can fully comprehend, you know, if I take these drugs that it actually means I will be infertile and will never ever be able to have children. It means I will possibly get cancer. It means I will possibly have heart attack, stroke, you know, young people. The frontal cortex lobe is not fully just developed. There's a reason why you can't drink, you can't vote, you can't drive a car until you're 18. And having young people make such drastic decisions that are going to affect the rest of their lives, you know, to me, it's just not good care of that young person. We need to allow them a chance to, to find out who they really are and to work through dysphoria if that's, you know, good counselling, I think is really important. There's a study by Dr. Zucker and he's actually had lots of high quality studies, but the transgender community has completely blocked his studies because it doesn't support their politically correct narrative. And in that study, it showed that the people who went to Dr. Zucker's clinic, 80 to 90% of those children, if they were left alone, they actually were happy with their birth sex by the time they became adults. So to me, wait, allow the child to go through puberty, allow them to see what they feel like once they're an adult. Let's not make decisions about kids. I think lately the development, which probably affirms what you've been talking about uh, with rapid onset gender dysphoria and how it's uh, encouraged by uh, some counsellors is that there was a story about uh, so-called gender whisperers in schools where teachers are told to look out for students who may have gender dysphoria, which is, it seems to be reversing the, the onus of who comes forward. Not of what, or what should happen is that a, a child presents themselves to a teacher or a doctor or their parents saying, I'm having these feelings, I need to um, have some way of dealing with them rather than a, a teacher basically looking at a child and saying, I think they may be transgender. Well, do you know, there's a story about a child in Canada, true story last year, three-year-old, they are playing, a girl playing with what would be seen as a boy's toy, you know, which is stereotyping. To me, it doesn't matter if a girl plays with trucks or a boy plays with dolls, you know, that's, that's okay. But because this girl was playing with what was seen as a boy toy, the teacher actually said to the child, you must be transgender. Now that child actually became very distressed and they went home very distressed to their parents. Their parents went in to meet with the school the next day and basically the parents were called, you're a homophobe, you're a bigot, you're a transphobe, because they didn't support the view that their daughter playing with a boy's toy actually meant she was transgender. And I mean, that is just the extreme ridiculous position that some people are taking with it now. So it's actually really scary, the implications of this, you know, 20 years time, how many young people are going to be coming forward? Like we've got if you look up on YouTube, there's several young people talking about the detransitioning because, and, and they say it, they say, I never had counseling. I never had issues looked at. And it was really because I was uncomfortable with my body and there was psychological issues. Now, our new Prime Minister, uh, Scott Morrison, he uh, was directly responding to the, the Gender Whisperer story and uh, talked about uh, uh, programs such as Respectful Relationships, saying it made his skin curl, and that's why he sends his daughters to uh, private school. And uh, we know that uh, well, he's a uh, firm uh, Christian, and one of the things that he wants to do is uh, uh, re open this issue of uh, religious freedom, which seemed to be uh, the, the Raddick report seems to be buried under Malcolm Turnbull's uh, prime ministership. <laughs> Do you consider Scott Morrison a friend of, um, of the cause? Well, I, I do consider that he wants to see 
healthy evidence-based programs in schools. And you know, he said as a parent, he is concerned that parents, all parents should have the right to raise their children within the values and the moral structure of the family that they come from. And so interestingly, I've heard that Daniel Andrews, in spite of the fact that he's pushing these programs in the public system, he sends his kids to private Catholic school. So to me, it says in one way, they're pushing values onto every kid in the public sector, but in another way, they're sending their kids to a private school, which not all parents can afford to do. So actually, it's quite interesting to me that someone who's not allowing choice is actually making a choice to remove his child from the worst of this stuff. Oh, well, we know that just because a school is private or independent doesn't mean it's immune from uh, the, these sort of programs. They can adopt their safe schools program if they want. There uh, was even a, a Catholic uh, sect which rolled out a safe schools like program in uh, their schools. Yeah, so you're right, Tim. We're not necessarily safe and I think that's something parents are starting to realise is that even though they assumed that a Catholic school or a Christian school would support the values that they believe in, that that is in some cases not the case. Now, when we last spoke to you, you uh, mentioned that there was a price uh, for you speaking out. Uh, you lost your position as a uh, counsellor for your participation in the the, the No uh, campaign. And uh, since then, we've seen even more cases of uh, people who um, are losing their job or, lo or basically being hounded out of polite society because they're speaking out against uh, uh, this gender bending agenda. Yeah, so basically I lost my accreditation with a mental health organization because in the end, and I actually have this in a document, is that they, they called it scientific theory, gender fluidity. And because I couldn't agree that if someone asked me, it actually wasn't in any of the curriculum that I taught, but I couldn't agree if somebody actually asked me about LGBTQI issues to teach gender fluidity. And so this is the place we're at where professionals are losing their jobs if they won't agree that somebody, oh yes, you've got confusion, you must be transgender. And so many professionals have spoken to me about their deep concern for children and young people, but they are too afraid to speak out in the workplace because they've seen case by case where people are losing their jobs if they dare to actually go against the new politically correct agenda. Well, the Labor Party, they've said if they win the next federal elections, that they want to uh, appoint an LGBTQI human rights commissioner. And I've already seen uh, how out of hand the, the human rights commissioner has got with things such as uh, 18C and other encroachments on uh, free speech. I mean, uh, you can imagine that commissioner is just going to go after people who, well, like you, and uh, s they're going to attract complaints of, or I, I, I'm offended by, by what they said here, here's a complaint, go after them. Well, we've, yeah, and we've already seen that happening. As you've rightly pointed out, you know, Human Rights Commission is really a nightmare for anyone who's conservative and holds conservative views. And, you know, I think of Bernard Gaynor and he's just been hounded and those laws have been weaponized against him for his, his belief that marriage is between one man and a woman. You know, we don't have free speech. We don't have a right to say these are my moral values and respectfully disagree. You know, I absolutely believe there should be no hate speech on either side. And actually what I observe is the moment I actually start bringing up some of the research that I'm aware of, I will be called a bigot. I will be labeled a homophobe. I've actually been called all kinds of names and it's like, well, can we talk about the research? You don't need to call me names. Just let's look at the research and have a, a respectful discussion. But it's almost like it's impossible for really far lefts to actually have a reasonable discussion. As soon as you bring out the research, you are actually labelled. Yes, well, we saw uh, Dr. Quinton Van Meter tour Australia. It was hosted by the Australian uh, Families Association and he wasn't allowed to speak at the University of Western Australia and in uh, Melbourne, uh, 
as we sadly expect, his uh, presentation was uh, interrupted by protesters. Yeah, I was actually there at his presentation and it was very insightful. Um, and yeah, I was amazed at the, the way protesters, they, they think they can just take over. And do you know, it's really amazing to me how they call the conservatives the hate crowd, but I've not seen a single conservative picketing their events. Exactly. I haven't seen conservatives beating up people who go to their events or, or you know, hurling abuse at people at their events. Yet they do it all the time to conservatives. So it's really the love crowd, if I can use that expression, that are spewing most of the hate in my observation. It's almost if, if, if somebody tries to show you how or says how compassionate they are, it's often in the end they turn out to be the least compassionate. <laughs> yeah, yeah, absolutely right. A lot of these people who talk about, well, the compassionate thing is to just say, yes, yes, Tim, you're obviously a girl. Tomorrow you can be Tanya, you know, whereas actually the compassionate and loving thing is to actually help you to feel comfortable in your birth sex to see if with psychological counselling that you can feel that way. You know, I've heard of many stories and I'll just relate one. There's a, a little boy, his name was Andy and the paediatrician says, okay, Andy is feeling like he's a girl. So she sends the family for psychological counselling. Now this is about 20 years ago. The family discovers that Andy, Andy makes this statement, mum and dad, you would love me if I was a girl. Andy had a younger sister who was born with disabilities and so understandably his very good parents are spending a lot of time and attention looking after him. So now he's gotten this false idea that, that she's loved and he isn't. They were able to resolve the gender dysphoria because they realised where it came from. And I think this is why we have a lot of suicides is we're not resolving the actual psychological issue, where the pain comes from, where the disconnect for the person's body. Now, so Andy is fine. He hasn't gone through these severe radical treatments where his body parts have been mutilated and on really dangerous hormonal treatments, you know, and a lot of people are unaware of actually the enormous risks involved in taking estrogen and testosterone over long term. And so Andy's great, but if Andy was here today, if he came to someone today, I can guarantee you the health professional would almost be too scared to go into the psychological area. You know, you, you must affirm and send them straight to the gender clinic. Do not pass go, do not collect $200. Now I thought we'd finish off with some of uh, comic uh, relief because it can <laughs> can quite uh, uh, being in this battle it can quite get uh, quite demoralizing but uh, uh, often you just have to laugh at laugh at some of these things given their absurdity now um there was a student editor who was uh, fired from a, a newspaper which uh, f uh, for yeah. tweeting that women don't have uh, penises which that's correct a university editor of a newspaper and yeah, he was called transphobic because he said women don't have penises. Well, he's biologically correct. Women don't have penises. But we've gotten to the point now where you can't even say a statement like that without actually being called transphobic and, you know, fired from your job. I mean, how ridiculous is that? And I think, you know, that's already happening in the UK. How long before we have that happening in Australia? And we also saw there was a credit director at uh, Sw uh, Swoozy, uh, I haven't pronounced that properly, which is a, a, a bank. Uh, there, uh, there was this man who liked to cross-dress at uh, work. Uh, he considered himself <laughs> gender fluid and he is in the, the top 100 uh, business women. Wow. And then we've also got Miss Sweden, who is transgender and, and Caitlin Jenner. Woman of the Year. Yeah, so yeah, um, pretty soon positions that were for women are now available to transgender women, which really are biological males. Uh, when, uh, when I spoke to Kiralee Smith a while back, she started a campaign, uh, Stop uh, Appropriating My Gender. <laughs> well, I understand a lot of the feminists are very upset too. And do you know, one of the things that people say is, you know, we don't even have a safe space in our toilets anymore. 
And I remember someone saying at their workplace, she walked into a bathroom and she felt really uncomfortable because there was this obvious man, but dressed as a woman in, in the bathroom. She felt really uncomfortable. She felt unsafe, but she's not allowed to express how she feels unsafe because it's all about that transgender person. Yes, and we saw at that uh, football game uh, a few months ago, the St Kilda Sydney, the, the Pride uh, match, they turned some of the bathrooms uh, gender neutral. And uh, the football is a very, uh, <laughs> uh, it's, a, it's a very intense environment. And that's mm. probably the, the last thing that you probably need an environment like that. And also, uh, I think any man would, like if they stuck a gender neutral sign on a female toilet that most men wouldn't want to go in there because it would it would just be too weird they don't want to make women feel uncomfortable um, either and most women don't want to go into toilets that men use because let's just be honest men's toilets are smelly there's Compa less cues <laughs> there is less cues that is a bonus but generally like you know and and i've been to unisex toilets where i go oh i have to use it because it's the only one around you know public council toilet but my gosh um when we had just female only toilets females certainly are generally a lot cleaner in the bathroom just a fact <laughs> tim sorry <laughs> Now, uh, what is the, the plan for you uh, going forward? Obviously, you're continuing with your uh, educational uh, speeches. We've got the, the state election in less than uh, two months where this is going, uh, safe schools is going to continue to be an issue. What, what do you plan on doing? Yeah, so, well, I, I do continue, plan to continue to help educate people about the danger of gender ideology and, and sexualizing children through education. So that would be one of the primary things in the immediate short term around the election time is helping people to understand. And actually, you know, people have to wake up that labor is sexualizing children through the programs that are going on. The Greens are sexualizing children. And if you don't wanna see children and young people sexualized and destroyed by gender ideology, then I suggest you really listen closely to all politicians listen to what they say and take a good think about what you want the future to be for the next generation. I think the most important thing is for as many people's eyes to be opened as possible. There's so much trust of the, the education system and, and schools by, by parents and they don't think that this is really going on, but they need to know, hey, it's, it's not just uh, us uh, whipping up things. This is what's actually uh, in the curriculum. And one of the hardest things with that, Tim, is that people continually lie. Oh, no, that's not in the program until they're actually caught out, whether it's on video or someone actually gets the curriculum and is able to expose the curriculum. And it's not until that point do they actually admit, actually, yes, this is happening. You know, there's that poster you can buy, buy with the boy in the dress. Mm. And Chella White, you know, talks about how when it all first started for her, they said, oh, no, there's no such thing as a poster with a boy in a dress. Well, you know, I've seen them myself in high schools. Yeah, they're proudly real. on the wall. They're around, you know. And, do you know, there, there's actually fantastic differences between men and women. They are equal but different. And we should celebrate those differences. You know, I love it when a guy is willing to be a gentleman and pick up something heavy for me. I'm not as strong as men. And that's just a biological yeah. fact. You know, and I think we should celebrate those differences, not force those differences. If someone wants to play with a different toy, no problem, you know, but, but allow people to be who they are. Let's stop pushing an agenda. And, you know, one of the concerns is that soon there'll be so many STDs because they are increasing rapidly. You know, there'll be so many health issues all related to what's going on now. Yes, it's certainly uh, something we need to keep uh, campaigning on and drawing attention to. Uh, thanks for joining me here in uh, our Melbourne studio, Diane, and coming down from uh, Ballarat, and uh, good luck in the, the next few months. Thanks so much, Tim. It's an absolute pleasure to be with you. All right, everybody, that's the show for today. In Melbourne, there is the annual March for the Babies being held at Treasury Gardens on Saturday the 13th of October at 1pm. It is held every year during this time, as it is the anniversary of the 2008 passing of Victoria's Abortion Law Reform Bill, which legalised abortion in uh, this state until birth. 
this held to remember all the babies killed and to advocate for the law to be changed to be better protect the unborn. Next up on the touring schedule in Australia is internet television personality and founder of the Proud Boys, Gavin McGuinness, who appeared on a previous episode of this show and is pumped to be coming to Australia and causing some mayhem here. He's being hosted by Penthouse Australia and you can book your place by going to gavinlive.com.au. As always, we would like to remind you, please consider becoming a patron of The Unshackled at patreon.com slash The Unshackled. Or like many of you are doing, please send us a direct contribution via our PayPal link, which is paypal.me slash The Unshackled. All of it goes a long way to making sure The Unshackled continue bringing you high quality content and covering all of the news and producing all the shows that we can. So please consider it. So thanks once again for your company and we'll see you next time. Thanks for tuning in to The Unshackled Waves. Please visit theunshackledwaves.net for all the ways to subscribe and follow the show. Don't forget to pick up your free ebook at theunshackledbattlefield.net and keep checking out theunshackled.net for all the latest news and commentary.